Thank you very much, Inuka, and thank you very much for uh, being here. Yes, uh, today uh, it's already very close to uh, leaving uh, Sri Lanka again, so tomorrow will be my last day here in, in the university, and it was really an interesting time. So I also talked to many of you, and it was really a great pleasure, so also thank you for uh, sharing uh, your ideas with me. Uh, today I want to uh, present you two topics. Uh, one is about musical instruments, uh, acoustics, simulations, experiment. I will show you what is required there and why we are doing this. And this talk, as well as the other talk, are also co-authored again uh, by some of my co-workers you can see here. Uh, by the way, uh, this person here, uh, he won several times uh, the German competitions for, uh, for young musicians. There's always a big competition, and uh, so he won it with a special, very complicated instrument. You will later see how simple the instrument was, which he investigated in his doctoral thesis. Okay, so um, who cares about acoustical investigations? Why is it interesting? There are many applications. For example, vehicles. If you buy an expensive car, you want to have it very silent. You do not want to hear noise. Um, room acoustics, if you uh, set up an acoustic uh, hall for concerts and so on, it's very important that uh, uh, you know what you are doing. For example, that there are no reflections, that you hear the sound very clearly. Um, it's important also for computer games. If you design a computer game, you want the sound right. Uh, it should be at the right position, it should sound natural. And then there are electric instruments and there are also acoustical instruments. We will focus on acoustical instruments mainly in this talk here. So there are many applications for acoustics. And I want to give you here a brief outline what will happen. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about psychoacoustics, the vibraphone, which is one special instrument, idiophone, sound synthesis, some measurements, validation of sound synthesis, and then also an optimization. Uh, later, I will continue with uh, guitars and another type of instrument. But what is psychoacoustics about? Uh, it's very strange. As engineers, we think that acoustics, this is just vibrations. And of course, it is just vibrations. But how a person uh, have a perception of acoustics is very different. So a well-trained uh, musician uh, hears music in a different way compared to me as an amateur. Um, so this is uh, really interesting. So uh, one thing is the signal, and the other thing is what the brain is doing with this sound. And I will give you an example in a moment. <coughs> um, so usually the sound is described by its spectrum. So here we have frequency or in the horizontal axis, we have amplitude here, and then different frequencies are represented differently in uh, uh, different strong. So here, for example, this frequency is very strong, this is strong, and so the mixture of frequencies makes a sound. <coughs> so, as I mentioned, the human perception is uh, different, and there are different things. Sometimes a sound is harmonic or it's disharmonic. It can be consonant, dissonant, I will explain this in a moment. There are critical band with speed frequencies, overtone series, all these kind of things. And you see, it's already getting a little bit complicated. So let us start simple. So <coughs> uh, usually a certain sound has a certain frequency. So if I sing here a song, then uh, for example, the note G has a certain frequency, and you know this. Um, if you just um, make an uh, electronic device to represent exactly this frequency, uh, it will sound very boring. It's very not a natural thing to do. Uh, what is really happening, uh, a nice sound is composed of the basic frequency and all the overtones. And the mixture makes it nice or not so nice. 
So here we all know this from mechanics. So here is, for example, for a string, this zero eigenform with F0, then there's the first eigenform and the second eigenform and also higher or eigenforms are available. Uh, <coughs> so uh, these ones here, the red and the black color, they are uh, called overtones. So <coughs> we have to take care of these. <coughs> and so if only uh, um, uh, integer number multiples are there, uh, something like this is called a harmonic sequence. This will become important in the following. But now uh, about this psychoacoustics, just to give you one idea. If you have a sound uh, with two frequencies, frequency F1 and frequency F2, and they are far away from each other, then you hear them as two notes, as two sounds. Oh, thank you very much. Then you hear them as two sounds. Now, what happens if they're getting closer and closer? Of course, if they go together, that is just one frequency, you hear only one tone. But if they're only a little bit apart, Ah, there, there it's getting interesting what happens. <coughs> and there is a certain uh, curve here with a critical bandwidth. So for a certain frequency, for example, for, for the frequency here, one hertz you or two hertz, you can go up, and then you see here 0.3, for example. And this means uh, there is a certain frequency distance. From this distance, you hear it definitely as two sounds. <coughs> if uh, there you are in the middle, there is a certain area where you only have heard one sound. But what is happening here? This is giving an interesting sound. So two frequencies, not exactly on, on top of each other, but a little bit apart, give an interesting sound. And how big this area is depends on the person, on the training, musical training of the person mainly. So this is a brain thing now, not a purely physical thing anymore. So very interesting, and it already shows us that it's not so easy to do acoustical uh, simulations and get informations about this. Um, there are the very famous old violins of Stradivari, for example. They were built 250 years ago in Italy. Um, still, these are the top instruments which exist in the world. Every professional music player would be delighted to have one of these instruments, and they really play these instruments in concerts. You can see them, you can hear them. And so the big question is, why are these special violins, in the opinion of professional musicians, better than all the music instruments you can build today? What has these people, have these people 250 years ago known what we do not know anymore now? And how can we make an instrument sounding as similar as possible? Um, there is a, a, a famous German music instrument maker. He is building uh, music instruments by hand, only by hand, and uh, he's selling his instruments only to top professionals. If I would go he there, he would tell me, no, I do not give you one of my instruments. <laughs> you cannot play it well enough. <laughs> no matter how much money I offer him, he will simply not give it to me. Uh, this person in his lifetime has uh, built about 300 violins, uh, all of them top quality, played by professionals all over the world. Uh, but there is one violin which sounds better than all the others. And the person, although he built it the himself, has no idea why. Every professional musician who goes there and uh, tests some instruments want to have this special violin. They all agree this is the best violin they ever had in their hand. And not even the instrument maker knows what he did in a different way. Was it the wood? Was it the aging? Was it some small details in the design? And this gives you an impression how difficult it is to make music instruments. Um, not the average one, not for the amateurs like me, no, the ones for the really ambitious players. So there are different kinds of music instruments. For some quarterphones, these are the ones with strings, membranophones, drums, for example. Aerophones, organs, trumpets are like this, electrophones, idiophones, we will talk about these later. Um, and these idiophones are, have a simple design. There is a bar, usually a metal bar, a certain shape. We will come to this, why this shape is there. And there are different ones of the, these shapes so that you can play different notes. There are resonating tubes below. This is to amplify the sound. <coughs> and then uh, there are some special discs where you can 
open more or less so that you can shape the sound a little bit and how loud it is. So quite simple thing. And this is one of these sound bars. Usually the material is made from aluminium. Uh, they are, have a quite simple geometry and uh, it is known that uh, the perfect overtone series would be 1, 4, 10. This means the second eigenfrequency which you are hearing must be four times the first eigenfrequency and the third should be 10 times. I have no idea why these numbers 4 and 10 are there, but all the people agree this is the optimal case. This gives the nicest sound. Okay, so this is how such a sound bar looks like. If you look a little bit closer, um, here on the bottom you can see it looks like damaged. Um, it, this is not damaged, this is done intentionally. This is how the music industry is changing the geometry a little bit to change the frequency response to make it sound better. And this is why uh, such one sound bar, although it looks quite simple, costs about um, the salary of a lecturer here at the university, a um, full monthly salary is paid just for this. And then the, the basic shape, this one here, is because of the first eigenfrequency. We can understand easily as engineers. But is this really the best thing you can do? In our opinion, no. And I will show you later how the optimal shape looks like. And it looks not like this one here, it looks a little bit different. So therefore our goal was we wanted to design the optimal sound bar, then manufacture it just with a milling tool, and then it's much cheaper, then it costs a few euro, and it does not cost 200 euro or so. Um, so um, but I will tell you later also why this was not such a clever idea from us. So we want to have this shape, the optimal shape later. But then for this, we first have to do a little bit more. We have to talk about the modeling. We have to talk about how we compute and predict the sound, how to measure everything. So a lot of work is to do before we can optimize such a shape. So first, the modeling. Uh, modeling is quite simple. We use finite elements for setting up a numerical model. We use model order reduction to reduce the number of equations because we have too many of them. Then we do a time integration and then we get surface vibrations. If we have surface vibrations, then we know at least what is exciting the sound. We do not yet know what the brain is doing. We do not yet know what is the transfer path between the vibrating surface and the, uh, and the ear. No, this is not yet known, but this is the first thing we can model and simulate. Okay, so if you do this, then you get, for example, uh, this kind of eigenforms. This is the first eigenmode, a very nice bending mode. The second eigenform is a torsion mode. Then here, this is a second eigen a bending frequency, and so on and so on. And then uh, we can think about um, what is happening. How does the sound come from the surface to the ear? Uh, it's very simple. The vibrating surface is moving the air. There are all these waves in the air. And so the, uh, the eardrum in your ear will recognize the uh, movement of the air or the change in the air pressure. So all this is about pressure distributions. Uh, by the way, after the eardrum, which is a simple a mechanical membrane, there come the three little bones, the smallest bones in the body. These three little bones are a mechanical filter. It's nothing else. It's just to shape the sound a little bit and to protect against two strong signals. And then comes the inner ear. The inner ear is a liquid-filled coil. And then this inner ear, uh, there's a, the, the third mo uh, little bone, the stapes, is moving this liquid around in this, helical sh uh, in this circular shape. And then at certain points are resonances. And then hair cells at resonance positions are excited. There are nerves and they give the information to the brain. So it's a wonderful mechanical system. That's why we for about 20 years investigated the mechanics of hearing a lot. And it was beautiful because sometimes doctors uh, have no idea about mechanics. And so in this sense, it's very nice to cooperate with medical doctors. They know how to make operations. They ha know how to deal with uh, clients and patients. And we know about mechanics. So here it turns out that some of these um, forms do not lead to any hearing impression. For example, mode two is not relevant for hearing impression because if one 
area is pushing in this direction, the other is dragging. And so this motion uh, basically cancels out and there is no information going to the ear. Okay, not all modes are important. We will select later a few of them. Then the, we need sound synthesis. If we have surface vibrations, the big uh, question is how does this information comes to the ear drum? And so we consider every surface point as a source of sound. As if there are small loudspeakers everywhere and from every uh, surface point we need the path to the ear. So it's not sufficient to just take one point, we have to take all of these points. And then the mixture of these sounds gives you the hearing impression. So we have this uh, point source, we have volume expressions, <coughs> then we uh, make the pass from the excitation to the listener, there are certain diagrams which result, and so you get here this kind of things. For example, uh, for a certain kind of excitation in such a uh, sound field, uh, the sounds are cancelling out. So here you do not hear much from the sound. Here the two things are amplifying, each, they add to each other. And so here it will be very loud, here also, here it will be very, uh, the noise will be very small. Uh, which can be intended, if you want to get rid of noise, you want to have noise cancellation. Uh, but if you are in a concert hall and you paid a lot of money for your ticket and you're sitting, uh, for example, and at this place here, uh, it's very disappointing for you because you will not hear too much from the sound. <laughs> so you want to have a place here. Um, so, and of course, the people who design a concert hall, they have to take care that all the customers are happy and not just a few. Okay, sound synthesis we have to do. And then we have to do measurements, simulations and measurements. Some of the measurements we only do to set up our simulation model. We need some parameter values. For example, there are certain uh, types of aluminum used and then we need the material properties. How can we get them? We only can measure them. So this is one kind of measurement we are doing. And we are using for this purpose uh, laser Doppler vibrometers. These are very nice measurement devices. You point a laser ray to a vibrating surface the ray is reflected and from the reflected ray you can find out what is the velocity and displacement of the surface you are looking at. The nice thing is you can do no, there's no need for touching, you can have long distances. So for example you can stand below a bridge and then 50 meters above you you can focus a point and get the vibration signal. But here we use it for example here to get material parameters for the finite element or we get them to get damping information. But we will need the measurements in some other areas too in a moment. Then we have to start this sound synthesis to get the hearing impression <coughs> and then we have to verify everything. So here you can see one of these sound bars. Uh, this is a measurement net we placed there so you can see many many points were measured with the laser Doppler vibrometer and we need an excitation mechanism who is just exciting the vibration here. Then we need suspensions, which are very, very important. Uh, very often we can see measurements done by not experts in vibrations where the suspension is done in a wrong way. You must make sure that it's really very soft to get rid of uh, additional modes. And on the other hand, uh, you can do many mistakes. I will show you later for the guitar, uh, a typical case. Okay, this is what, what it looks like. The first measurements were quite disappointing, so we had to build um, a, a soundproof chamber to get rid of all these reflections. We had to enter, add four sensors. So it became more and more complicated. And then when this thing was hitting, we always get this kind of double hits, something like this, and this is also not good. So you want to have one hit and then restrict it that you only have one clear impact. Uh, for uh, doing all these things. So you can see measurements are really something complicated and when we do measurements, uh, the first measurements are never uh, okay. Uh, in the first few weeks of measurements, you always find out what you have done wrong and then you have to improve it step by step uh, and only after a few, few weeks usually measurements are useful and precise. Okay, and then you get a vibrating surface like this. This is now not simulation, this is what we measured with our laser Doppler vibrometers. Okay, from these excitations of the surface, 
we can synthesize the sound. And then we have another way of getting uh, an idea about the sound. Uh, this is using a microphone. Of course, the microphone does not need to synthesize the sound because a microphone is measuring the sound already. And so we placed there some special microphones. We needed very small microphones here in our uh, soundproof chamber. Okay, now how can we uh, kind of validate this? When we want to validate this, we always need something different to compare it. And here our comparison was uh, a comparison with the boundary element method. <coughs> boundary element method is well established for acoustical simulations, and so we compared the boundary element simulations with microphone measurements. <coughs> and here you can get one of these uh, results. Uh, again, frequency, here the sound pressure. Um, here the blue curve is the boundary element method. Uh, the black curve is our sound synthesis. And you can see the positions of the peaks agree very nicely. Sometimes there's a small difference. These things here are not interesting. Here the frequency is getting too high, also not interesting. But our sound synthesis, based on some MATLAB code, took about two seconds boundary element took about seven hours to for the computation. But we know now, okay, our sound synthesis is working well for this uh, vibraphone uh, blades. Uh, later, we also applied this together with Daimler Benz for the interior of a car, and this situation was much, much, much complicated because all of the different materials and geometries. So there it worked not as nicely as here, but uh, you can also use it and save a lot of time. These are the fields, uh, sound fields you can compute and measure, and so we are happy with this. Um, yeah. <clears throat> now, um, what we are using here frequently are these kind of diagrams. Uh, here we have the time, and here is the sound pressure. And we can see, for example, that um, for a certain uh, frequently, frequency, so here's frequency and the color is the sound pressure, sorry, uh, you can see, for example, uh, this frequency is there and it's there for a very long time. Some higher frequencies, this frequency here, for example, is damping out very fast. And this is changing the sound. Um, if you have only one line here, you have a very clear frequency, but it sounds very boring, and we want to have the mixture of overtones. And now, how long are these different forms? This is something interesting to evaluate. And you can see here that simulation and microphone measurements are quite close also together. Now, um, we want to change something. Our idea was we want to get the optimal bars, sound bars, and we want to find the geometry. So for this reason, uh, we modified the geometry and looked, uh, does it have an influence? So unfortunately, it's, it's not loud enough, uh, but these three geometries they sound different. If you listen carefully, it's, I think it's too far away and the air condition is too loud. Um, so unfortunately, you cannot hear it nicely. But even with just with the ear, you can distinguish these three blades. So these small geometry changes obviously have a certain role. No. Okay, now let's optimize the thing. One of these sound bars here are three famous companies. Bergerot, Musea are two French companies, Yamaha, a Japanese company. Uh, they offer these sound bars for high prices, um, cost something like 150, 170 euro um, per, for one bar. And the, on the, at the first glance, they look quite similar. So here we have the three bars of the three different companies. They all have this kind of shape. It's natural, it's just physics. It's the first eigenform they want to excite. So they all ha have to have it. But then if you compare them uh, more carefully, you can see differences and you can hear differences. So here for the Yamaha blade, uh, there are a few partials below 4 kilohertz. Uh, 4 kilohertz is nice because this everybody can hear. Um, uh, some of you are very young, so you also hear 15, 18 kilohertz. Uh, I'm too old, I guess I hear only maybe 12 kilohertz or so. Um, if I'm happy, I hear 12 kilohertz. <laughs> um, so uh, the, the sound is different. And um, in this region, everybody from us can hear it. And here again, the eigenforms. And for example, these two eigenforms, 
uh, they are missing in the spectrogram, so here in the measurements. They are simply not there. And this clearly says, okay, they exist in physics, they are there, they are, give vibrations, but they do not give any sound impression because the sound waves are cancelling out for these two, for example. So this is important, this is important, these are important. So we have to concentrate on those. <coughs> uh, and so the overtone series here is, the first is 175 hertz, the second is 700 hertz. Now we can do some computation, multiply 175 with fi uh, 4, so we're getting close to what we want to have. Then we can do multiply by 10, but here you can see already that it's not so good anymore. So remember, 1, 4, 10 is the optimal thing. 1, 4, all the blades can do 10. They already not do very well. This is because they not used any mechanical engineering to manufacture them. They should have asked mechanical engineers to improve this situation here. Uh, for the force number, nobody really knows what is the optimal thing. Uh, why? Because for centuries it was not possible to shape the, four, uh, the mode number six. Okay, so this is not really satisfying. And for the different companies, the, it looks a little bit different, uh, but they never uh, really catch this well. So here you can see, for example, for the Bechereau blade, this one here is only very short. This frequency in the Museo, Museo blade is very long. So obviously there are differences and musicians will hear it. Okay, so now we try to make an optimization to get 1, 4, 10 precisely. Okay, so we defined uh, the shape uh, of this undercut. Uh, we defined some control points moving up and down these points. And then we run optimization. The objective function was to be as close as possible to the target frequency. We added some weighting functors. This is typical optimization, shape optimization. We can do it. And then a nice shape of the undercut resulted. This shape of the undercut we um, gave to our workshop. They did the milling in high quality, and then we get what very nice blades. So again, here I have the original sound. I have the optimized sound. Uh, if it would be not as loud here in the room as it is, um, and if you come closer, you would hear a difference, and the optimized sound sounds better. Very nice. Okay, now uh, one would think that the company no, uh, would be very enthusiastic. Okay, now we have the optimal shape. Uh, let's build the optimal shape. No. <clears throat> what happened was uh, we had a meeting with the company. We showed them the results. We made this exit, um, we showed them the sound. So they believed immediately, okay, it's better. Uh, and then they told us, okay, please just give us the report and do not tell anybody about it. Uh, <laughs> they not wanted to have this. Why? Because if you have such a machine uh, engineered tool like this one here, there is no emotion behind. People will not pay a lot of money for this. They tell, okay, this is just done by a machine. Maybe it's worth 20 euro or so. The other one was done by a very old man in remote um, France in the snowy Alps. This is the story he always told. And then he has the absolute hearing. He's sitting with his hammer and then it's the optimal thing. This is an emotional thing and everybody wants to have such an emotional thing. And then you can ask for high prices. So it was really funny, although it was, from an engineering point of view, really better. Uh, they did not want to sell this. They ju just gave us money to keep it for us and not give the results to anybody else. So very interesting. Sometimes as engineers, you are really desperate. Uh, if you really are proud, and my co-worker was so happy with the result, and everything was nice. <laughs> he was too young. He was not in the French Alps, and, and so... <laughs> okay, so I want to continue the story now with more complicated musical instruments. And we are concentrating on guitars. Guitar, similar to violins, there are also some instrument maker, let's say 120 years ago, who really made the best guitars in the world. Still their design is copied again and again, and their quality is still not really reached by today's music instrument makers. And so Pascal Ziegler, vice director of our institute, 
um, he's a musician himself and he has here two guitars and then the question is which one to take? Can we distinguish and how can we distinguish the sound of guitars? How can we tell uh, which guitar to buy for example? They all look more or less the same but the sound is different and I will come later to how we can approach this. So should he prefer one of the others. And there was a big investigation a few years ago where different materials were compared and so it was very clear just for the soundboard, this is the material on top of the guitar below the strings, um, usually people preferred uh, or musicians a lower density and lower longitudinal stiffness. So this was quite clear, they were, were more happy with these kinds of designs. Although from the geometry these instruments cannot be distinguished. Now the problem comes, you usually cannot see in this kind of instruments. You can only see them from outside, you not really know what is inside. But you need the inside information to make a computer model of it. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I'm not playing guitar, so I'm not an enthusiast. So I made the recommendation, okay, let us simply buy two identical guitars and then take a big knife and then cut the guitar and then you can measure it and so um, and Pascal was completely shocked. No, this is a good guitar. You cannot destroy it. We, <laughs> we have to change the project. I do not never destroy a, a guitar. This is an interesting instrument and I cannot sleep anymore if I have a damaged guitar. Okay, so we had to come to a different uh, possibility um, and I will show later where we got this um, parameters from. Here you can already guess it a little bit. Uh, this has to do with hospitals and CT scans and all this expensive environments. Then again, we need finite element models. We need experimental model analysis, so measurements. We need a lot of numerical methods for parameter identification and model updating. And so this became over many years a quite complicated and nice um, thing to do. So as engineers, the guitar is for just, us just an input-output system. You give an excitation, you create a sound. There's an input, your excitation, and there's a sound, which is the output. Of course, it's a complicated nonlinear system, but that's considered as linear at the moment. So you get a transfer function, which is typical for a single guitar. Then we can identify the modal parameters, the eigenfrequencies, the damping, the mode shapes, and then we get uh, uh, forms like this. I will come to this in a moment back. Then we try to make some experimental setup. So this is a nice uh, scanning laser Doppler vibrometer, an expensive uh, device. The cost of such a device is about of 10 new cars. So uh, expensive thing, but a wonderful measurement device. So you can measure many points at the same time and all the complicated things, wonderful. Uh, we have a few of these, fortunately, because we also have a nice cooperation with the company producing these kind of instruments. Then we place the guitar there, we hang it up here, uh, we remove the strings because they are not necessary for the structural response. We have here an automatic impulse hammer, signal conditions, oscilloscope, function generators, all kinds of things. And then we try to do measurements. Okay, this was the result of such a measurement. Frequency and then some amplitude things. Um, is it good? Is it not good? No, it's not good. Uh, although it was the first measurement, so you expect that it's not yet perfect. Um, so we compared it with these mode shapes, with computed mode shapes. Many things look good, others look not good. And so we really had to look more careful at these peaks. And it turned out that these peaks are partially wrong. Of course, the measurement was correct, but we set the setup of the measurement was not correct. So therefore, for example, to give you an impression what is important here, we the hanging uh, we changed. So it was uh, suspended on the top of the guitar originally. Here was some wire and then some springs. So at the first glance you say, okay, this is good, and so no problem with this. But then it turned out if we change it, for example, to such a hanging here, a little bit to in this area instead of this area here, uh, then the results are different. Here you can see the results. So remember the red one was the first measurement, the blue one is the updated measurement. So these peaks here just originated from this kind of hanging. This was not the guitar itself, it was just the way we 
enter the guitar to the experiment. So be very careful. When you do experiments, never believe the results. You really have to think very carefully, can it be true, what is the reason for it? And then very, very often you have to go back to lab and uh, redo the experiment with improvements. This peak here, this is the same for both types. This is guitar. This one here is just the hanging of the guitar. So be always ca very careful when you do measurements and when you interpret these measurements. Okay, so we found a good setup finally, and uh, so the upper suspension was not okay, the lower was very good. So then we were able to compare something like this, and now, now we tried to uh, uh, compare the measured eigenfrequencies and forms and the uh, computed, the simulated. And so we used a modal assurance criterion for the comparison, which is comparing eigenvectors somehow, and you get a matrix, and a good matrix should look like the lower one. Uh, it should be a diagonal matrix. This means that the computed modes and the uh, measured modes are in a very high agreement. So what we received was something like this. Again, very disappointing if you get such a result. So the first things, okay, they, they, they are good. The first ones are always good. Here it's already not so good. Here it has nothing to do with each other. So obviously, either the measurement or the simulation or both are wrong. And be careful uh, if you work together with other people. I'm a simulation person. So of course, I'm, te intended, uh, I'm tempted to point my fingers to the uh, measurement guys. Oh, you did, you did the mistake. And they use the same thing, oh, you know, you did the mistake. I think we all did the mistake. And so uh, be careful uh, to really search together for the reason for such mistakes. Okay, so therefore we had to improve further. Uh, we had to identify the geometry more carefully, the materials. For example, wood is a natural material, so there's a certain fiber orientation. If you are machining metal, there is usually not a big orientation, which is also wrong because uh, if you roll something, there's also a preferred direction. But wood has all these fibers, and so it really depends how you cut it. I do not want to go into the details. Um, but uh, finally, we found all this out, and then uh, we tried to validate this more carefully. So we had a beautiful finite element model available, but some parameters were missing. Okay, now, as I mentioned, um, Pascal not agreed to my proposal to destroy the guitar to make measurements. So uh, we called our hospital. We have a big hospital in Stuttgart, and we told men, oh, we have a very sick guitar here, and you have this beautiful environment. Um, can we use your fancy um, measurement devices? And then uh, finally they agreed, okay, bring your sick guitar, and then we place it here. Usually people with brain cancer and all the complicated things are here. And so uh, they agreed to um, make this CT scan of the guitar. Um, of course, there are all these kind of restrictions. <coughs> For example, uh, we had to prove, or they had to prove together with us, that not a person was involved in this. So um, for it would be horrible if a person is dying because he had no measurements here and we investigate a guitar. This would not be fair. So in this sense, uh, they have always a certain number of hours per week free where they do, for example, maintenance of the machine and some updating. And so it was required to document very carefully that not a patient suffered because we did our measurements, but this was done in the maintenance time of the machine. And the hospital even insisted uh, that it only can, do, can be done after hours they not allowed us to waste staff hours for this kind of things. <laughs> of course, it was not a waste of staff hours. It's about a guitar and an interesting simulation and investigation and comparison. Uh, but uh, there are all kinds of interesting restrictions if you do such things. Okay, so we get very detailed um, CT scans of the guitar. And so it was possible to get all the geometrical shapes inside of the guitar with very, very high accuracy. So maybe a tenth of a millimeter or so, and this is really sufficient to do a thing. And we can see, for example, there are all these bracing things, and they are different from different manufacturers. There's a lot of experience how you do these bracing patterns and how to make the interior shape of such a 
such a key term. It's clear that they not want to, to reveal this to everybody. And also, a guitar is a complicated thing because there are up to 10 different types of wood included. Um, so some parts here, for example, are made from mahogany, some spruce, some rosewood, some cedar. Um, all this has a good advantage. It makes a lot of sense for the guitar maker. Um, but of course, it's very difficult. It's not just one material, it's very different materials. And there is an even worse um, effect. Some of these woods are very rare. In the past, they simply are exported and uh, used by the guitar makers. Today, some of these woods are protected. This means you need a special permission if you get a certain type of wood and uh, use it for guitar making. Um, in this sense, uh, this is a complicated thing. And one of our projects is, for example, can we mimic the sound of such a guitar made with cell um, with wear, with protected wood, can we mimic this sound also using local woods so um, to get the same effect, which requires a lot of engineering and is very nice, uh, by the way. Um, to tell another story, so I, I think I also wanted to tell you a little the story for, so from our experience with companies and so on. Up here, there's a little piece of material. Um, this is where the strings are bended uh, and then they are run in parallel to this one here. Just a little bit piece, maybe five centimeters long, uh, five centimeter, uh, millimeters high, a very small piece. And you can buy them either very cheap for something like five euros, um, um, five euros, what is this, 2,000 rupees, something like this, or you can spend for this part also 5,000 euros, so a factor of 1,000 times higher. Uh, the very expensive one is made, for example, from stone mammut bones. So mammut, this giant elephants in ancient times, million years ago, and some of them are buried in the ground and their bones become, uh, become stone after a while, uh, simply because all these minerals enter the material and so on. Yeah, you can get it. And so you can buy this mammoth uh, material here. And now the question is, uh, is it worse to do so? Is it improving the sound or is there no, no difference? Um, and the answer was, yes, it is improving the sound. So an experienced guitar player can hear a difference between this very expensive mammoth thing and the cheaper plastic material thing. And then the question was, for example, why? What was the difference? And the difference was not the material, it was not the mammoth, no. It was for this mammoth thing, uh, the production was very, very accurate. Of course, they, wa they wasted so much money, so they could spend a few additional hours to manufacture it very carefully. The cheap one was uh, manufactured in a very cheap and simple way. And the effect was <coughs> that there are small holes there to guide the strings. For the cheap ones, the string could make a certain motion in this gap. For the expensive ones, it was really fixed and there was nearly no motion. So yes, the mammoth was better, but for the wrong reasons. It was just a manufacturing uh, question. Um, of course, again, a similar thing, of course, companies and whatnot want to hear that they sh should use a, a simple material and just spend a little bit extra money for precise manufacturing. No, they prefer to buy the uh, to sell the mammoth. Um, but it's interesting how what, what people are doing to get a little bit a better instrument. Okay, um, then we had to consider the fluid structure interaction. We have the wood, but there's also air inside. The sound is created by air, pressure waves in the air, so we have to compute the, uh, the frequency response also for the air which is added there, Helmholtz vibrators and so on. I do not want to go into details. And then we were able to update uh, the model, so it went, was a little bit better at the very beginning, but still not good. Then we had to see whether what is wrong. Are the experimental results reliable? Yeah, they are very repeatable, very precise. Is the geometry good enough? Yeah, it was done in the hospital with the uh, CT scans. Is all the physics included? Yes. So it was the material parameters. So we had to take care of the material parameters also to really get a good uh, model. I do not want to go in all these details now. I've jumped a little bit about this. 
So you need to get off the, um, very complicated material laws. You have to reduce the number of materials to only the most sensitive ones. You do a sensitivity analysis, which parameters have a high influence and which are not so influential. A lot of mathematics involved. A sensitivity analysis is performed, which um, parameters influence which eigenmodes. So you can see there's a lot of things going on for just such a music instrument. You need too much computation time. You have to reduce it using remodel order reduction. And, 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 I want to jump over this, not to waste too much time. I just want to give you the final result after all these kind of things. And this was this one here, the updated results. Now we have a nearly diagonal matrix. So this means that the mode shapes of our simulation and the mode shapes of our measurement agree very well. So we can, for example, pick up this one here, the number eight, and see in experiment, you get this form. In simulations, you get this form. And this is considered as sufficiently good. There are very small differences here, for example, in this area. But, but this is considered as an excellent agreement. <coughs> OK, so here we are very happy. Now, uh, let me go to the very end. And I want to just, because I took too much time, I want to give you some conclusions here. So. <coughs> What do you need? So you always need good experimental results. This is the basis whether you can judge is the reality and your simulation fitting to each other. You need to spend a lot of effort and time to get the geometry, the material, all the physics right. And always keep in mind, whatever you have not included in your model cannot be described there. For example, ignoring the air in the model gives simply wrong results. The air is important, so it must be included. And <coughs> so now what uh, is going on from here? Uh, we have a nice cooperation with um, the University of Cremona in Italy. Cremona is a small city, <coughs> maybe 50,000 inhabitants, but they have more than 200 companies in Cremona building music instruments. This is for centuries uh, the center in Europe for music instrument making. And of course, they have a wonderful museum, including some of the Stradivaris. Uh, they have uh, a lot of experience with everything, really wonderful. And so <coughs> uh, we have an, uh, an experience with uh, a cooperation with them. And the purpose is to shape the geometry of the guitar and to change it only a little bit so that we are able to adjust an average, not too expensive instrument, to the sound of a very expensive original instrument. And so this is very nice. And they also have in the university music instrument makers, experts who can produce all this. And so we are building our own guitars now uh, with an optimized shape. So this is a very nice thing to do. Of course, it would not be possible for us to do something like this alone. It really requires the help and the uh, assistance and cooperation of experts from other fields too. Okay, here I want to stop my first talk, which was about these music instruments. And once again, the intention was to show you a little bit what is required for making these kind of investigations. And also, I jumped over many slides because I was talking too long anyway. So therefore, uh, you get maybe let a get a little bit of an impression. There's a lot of mathematics behind. There's a lot of mechanics behind. There's a lot of computer science behind. And if you do projects like this, you have to consider all of this. And I'm very happy with our uh, co-workers and doctoral students who are able to do this. And then still it needs a lot of time. This is not done in a few weeks. This is the work of many years of research uh, and investigation of these systems. Uh, feel free to ask uh, questions whenever you want. And I want to thank you again very much uh, for attending this talk and for your interest in, in the topic. So, mm -hmm. thank you. Are there any questions or comments? Just feel free to ask. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, the the yes, yes, the idiophones. Yes. Uh, the ratio one is to four is to ten. Yes. 
Yeah. Right. Uh, one and four were there. Yes. And ten was not there. So yep. how would, when you did simulation to make, make sure that it becomes ten, yes. or close to ten, right. what is the effect on that from one and one is to four? Um, is there an effect? Yeah. No, 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 no. This, this was there. We, we have to keep this. Let me just jump back. I just have to see. Um, this is uh, the duty of the optimization algorithms. Um, mm, sorry, I'm there here in a moment. Yeah. Um, <coughs> here, when you do an optimization, you need three things. One is a model of the system you want to optimize. And this model has to describe the physical system as good as possible. The second thing is you must be allowed to change something. So um, if you work in a company and your boss says you should optimize something but you're not allowed to change anything, then it makes no sense. You always need to ch the possibility to change things that you can improve something. And the third thing is you need an, a criterion how to judge what is better, what is worse. And the criterion, the objective function, was here, uh, this one here. For the first uh, five eigenforms, uh, we computed the difference between the two uh, frequencies. So this was here the one, the target, the factor 10, for example. This was the one we had in our simulation. And then we made it a relative distance. We also added some weighting factors here uh, to emphasize certain uh, forms especially. And so in this sense, all five first eigenforms have been included here. The other uh, thing... One from, uh, from one to five. Yes, right. Um, but you can also do it in a different way. You can make constraints. Uh, you can say, uh, if I improve one criterion, I'm not allowed to worsen the other criterion by more than 2%, for example. And then you can use the flexibility in one criterion to improve something else. So there are different ways of using this optimization. Uh, if you only uh, use here, leave this away and only use one, uh, it happens exactly what you guess. Uh, the 10 will be beautifully caught, but instead of 4, it's then 4.5 or something like this. And then you're just moving around the problem. It's uh, like um, sometimes in, in, in Europe, because it's so cold outside, people have carpets on the floor. And when you lay such a carpet, it's really annoying because you want to have it really flat and if you press it down, what is happening at another place, it's going up. You press this other place down and then it's going here, up here. Uh, so it's really annoying to um, make such a carpet really plain. And the same happens with optimization. If you are not doing it carefully, you improve one situation and this one gets worse. Then you do this one and this one gets, gets, gets worse. And so it's really horrible. Therefore, do it right. <laughs> this is the purpose of multi-criteria optimization. Mm -hmm. Any further questions here? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I do not see further questions. So um, should we make a few minutes break or should we continue immediately? So what, what do you prefer? Both is fine for me. So we, we continue. OK, OK. So then let's make a five minute break and then we continue with the second talk. Mm -hmm, wonderful. I personally, I'm a simulation person, so, so I like to more to do simulations. Uh, but then it's always the question: What has has the simulation to do with reality? And uh, for then you have to do experiments, or you need some experimental data from other persons. Uh, 
uh, here we did everything with lab um, um, uh, experiments ourselves. Uh, we not did uh, hearing comparisons. There are uh, some nice experiments where you have a, a curtain. Uh, in front of the curtain there are some experts sitting, they just listen. Behind the curtain there are musicians playing.
the five core parts uh, create here the DPA at Nova Two Vac. Uh, this is about the simulation and analysis of optical mechanical systems. It's a combination again, where it's which is a little bit untypical. If you think about optical systems, you have not mechanical systems in your mind and vice versa. But I will show you where this combination comes from. And it's even worse because also the thermal effects play an important role here. Again, it's the cooperation with some of my uh, previous and current co-workers. And also I will show you one part of it later, uh, which was done by a graduate from this university, from um, uh, University of Moratuva, who helped us in some of the experiments here. So what is the motivation? Um, when you do uh, think about optical systems, you have, for example, these big mirrors which are used to uh, observe the space. Uh, <clears throat> and then, of course, if you have such a mirror, this mirror has deformations, and if there are deformations, then uh, something is disturbed. The optical image is disturbed. This is, for example, one reason why these uh, big telescopes are not uh, made close to the city center, because there are too many optical disturbances, there is too much heat in the, uh, in the air, all this must be eliminated, and therefore they are usually in some very dry and very remote areas. Or here for chip uh, deformation, there are these special objectives, I will come to this also later, expensive devices, so this one here um, is ba basically um, one meter sixty high, um, about this diameter, uh, and um, there are up to 30 lenses included. It's the same as in your camera, it's just much, much bigger, much more precise. Uh, but this is also something which is still state of the art, but the next thing is already um, uh, seen. I will show you the most complicated machines on the world which exist in a moment. But it's also used, for example, for manufacturing. For example, if you have here a metal piece and you want to have a very thin uh, cut here, uh, this is often done with laser cutting. Close to our university is the company Trumpf. They are world market leader for laser cutting. And so a lot of energy is flowing through the optical, optical system because here you need a lot of energy to make the cutting. And this energy is deforming and changing the lenses. So you change the optical behavior by this huge power you need for this. So there are many things uh, where mechanics and optics somehow interfere. So this is a typical photolithography machine. Uh, somewhere here, you create laser light. This is then going up uh, all this way until here. Uh, this, this system here is just to making the laser light perfect so that it's uh, very well distributed over a long, large area. Then here you have a thing which is projected. It goes through these lenses. Here you have a silicium blade, looks like this. And here are all these chips. If you look at just one of the chips, it has a very complicated structure in the meanwhile, and you want to have these structures getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Why? Because you expect that your computers and mobile phones and whatever you're using are getting faster and faster, and therefore the st structures must be very small so that the, uh, that the distance a signal is traveling is reduced. So if this is too large, the, system, uh, the signal simply need too long and your chip will be slow. Okay, so many things can go wrong here. Um, this is a very strange industry. Um, for example, you can see here a machine uh, from ASML, which is a Dutch company, and uh, Zeiss. Uh, Zeiss is, is a German company producing the optical part. Uh, ASML is producing the machine part. And ASML may only buy optical systems by Zeiss, and Zeiss may only sell optical systems to ASML. They are very close coupled. And I talked to the development head of Zeiss, a senior person working for 20, 30 years in this company, and he told me he never saw a single machine of a different company in his all his lifetime. So when you buy such a machine, you have to sign contracts that you never show it to a competitor. Uh, you can only have it in your company, but never show it to anybody. It's very unusual. If you have a milling machine, a turning machine, you can show to others. And the companies are even happy if you show it to others because it's advertisement for them. But this machines and this com uh, industry is very different. So up there, there's a reticle, then there's the lithography objective, 
and down there is the wafer. Um, <clears throat> and then mechanical things, very small disturbances can completely destroy the chips. So for example, seismic excitations. If um, uh, a subway is driving along, destroys the chip. If um, an air condition is working, destroys the chip. If uh, the radiator of a computer is working, destroys the chip. So very small disturbances already destroy everything. So the basic process is simple. You have this, for example, ultraviolet ra um, uh, radiation. Uh, it's projected through a reticle. It goes through this uh, set of lenses. Then uh, here's a, a resist and a substrate. And so here uh, you get this, uh, these structures. There is some chemical things, etching and so on going on. And here is the wafer structure for your chip. So this is what it, how it should be. From here to here, there's a reduction only a factor of four. So this is not a lot. If you have a strong magnifying glass, it's larger, this factor. But the big uh, challenge is you want to have it the same over the complete silicium blade. This is the big issue here. And then, of course, um, if um, you have some disturbances, for example, if the lenses are moving, then also your rays will move and your resist will not get the right information. So the mask will not be OK. And finally, you have to throw away the created chips. So this is why it's so uh, important and so interesting. Now, the next thing is interesting. Um, this machine here. These are the, in the opinion of most people I know, these are the most complicated machines which exist in the world. Um, what is the problem? If you want to have the structures getting smaller and smaller, it's not possible anymore to use light. Why? Uh, uh, you need, um, oh no, of course, it, you need light, but uh, you cannot reduce the wavelength of the light more and more. Why? Because if you have very short wavelengths of the light, then a glass lens is not transparent anymore. Therefore, you have all these mirrors here instead of glass lenses. So the laser light comes from here. Here's a kind of reticle. It's projected back and forth. Finally, down here is the silicium, which is uh, using it. These uh, mirrors, they are kept in their place by electromagnetic fields. All this is in vacuum. And they are very highly controlled, very precisely controlled. They're just floating in air. There's no, nothing which holds them at their right place. Um, and this is very, very complicated, of course. I will show you a video uh, showing a little bit of this machine. To give you an impression, um, if you want to buy such a machine, you should uh, start early to save some money. Um, I was told what is about the salary of a young lecturer here at the university. Uh, to buy such a machine, you need uh, the se monthly salary of two million lecturers of the University of Moratuba. <laughs> Just imagine how expensive this is. Two million persons, the salary for a month, <laughs> incredible. Um, of course, there are not so many machines like this um, in the world. If a company wants to buy something like this, there must be a good reason for doing this. And then um, there's only one consortium of companies able in the world to produce these complicated machines. All the others failed completely. Now, let me give you here an, the machine and the video. Sorry, uh, the, the sound you cannot hear, but I can show you a little bit. So this is the machine here. It looks innocent. Uh, it's opened in a moment. So here you can see this wavers uh, moving the silicium blade back and forth, um, cooling devices. There are the, all these little robots involved. All these robots must be extremely reproducible. Everything, of course, with the most fancy materials you can imagine, laser light, um, focused with some expensive things. Um, <clears throat> so here, this mirrors, of course, in extremely high precision. Um, it's going back and forth, everything floating in space. So it's really incredible that this, this, that this can work. I, I cannot understand how a company can invent, invent this and how a company can produce things like this. But of course, it required decades of research of these companies to be able to do it. Uh, sometimes there are just very s simple looking things. Uh, for example, no, it's not this one here. Uh, um, 
This robot is not critical because it, uh, it's quite flexible. This robot here is critical, this one here. Uh, a company near to Stuttgart is producing this robot. It just has two arms here, just two rotations, and still these robots are incredibly accurate. Uh, if you make a motion and want to repeat it, uh, they can go down to nanometers for the repetition accuracy. Really incredible devices. So you can see there is a lot of things are going on. Mechanics, thermal control, optical things, laser light, and so on. Really, really fascinating things. <coughs> so, okay, so now le let me jump over this and continue uh, what is about this. These machines are called extreme ultraviolet lithography machines, and they are required because light does not pass lenses anymore if the wavelength is too short. And there are all kinds of disturbances again. Uh, I will show you later how to do computations. Uh, oh, here, this is one of the new, uh, the European Extremely Large Telescope. Um, this is the Brandenburg Gate in Berlin, in front of our parliament. So this is much larger structure. Uh, if I know right, it will be built somewhere in a remote area in Spain. Uh, expensive thing, therefore it's done together with uh, many countries. Uh, the light comes from space here. It's collected by the big mirror. Then it's reflected to the secondary mirror going down here to this tertiary mirror, uh, no, here, and then it's going out. And here are the sensors uh, which are used to, uh, to uh, take the images itself. Um, so really complicated things. And of course, one cannot buy, uh, build such a big mirror in sufficient accuracy. Therefore, it's a network of smaller mirrors, and the mirrors are produced one by one and controlled one by one. Or the laser cutting I mentioned with this nice trumpf machines, very interesting uh, problems they have. Okay, but let us not start with the extremely complicated things, but with the simple things. So if you have a light source, this light source sent out rays, like um, the bulbs here or the, uh, for lighting here. Then usually you only want to have them in a certain area, so there are aperture stops like this one here, and then you have lenses, and these lenses, they will change the direction. Uh, there is Snell's refraction law, so if you enter a, a, a material with a different optical properties, then the light ray bends. This happens, for example, if you go from air to glass or from glass to air. So therefore, these light rays are bent, change the directions, and the same happened also if you leave the lens anymore. Then, if the lenses are produced in a nice way, uh, all the uh, rays are coming to this place here, and so this is the image, and this is uh, what you really want to see. Here is, for example, your chip, um, which you want to produce. Okay, <coughs> the object plane and the image plane. And now there are different things which can go wrong. For example, the focus point can move up and down. This is called chief ray deviation. Or uh, the wavefront cannot be circular as it is here. It can be, uh, have, have, have another, another shape. Um, <coughs> there are, can be reflections. All kinds of things can go on. And this is, for example, uh, are the rays passing through one of these optical devices. Start here, and it's widening. It's going back and forth. And many of these things are done to have a very good distribution here in the image plane over a really huge area. So if you use your camera uh, of the mobile phone and make a printout, you usually make a printout maybe this size. Here in this size, everything is fine. Imagine you make a printout uh, which uh, you want to glue to a, uh, the house. Then you need maybe 20 meters by 10 meters, and then you will see all the problems of your small uh, camera. Uh, suddenly, uh, the things are not parallel anymore, which should be parallel, and this kind of things. Um, I myself have, um, f fortunately, I do not need glasses usually, um, but uh, it has a strange reason, because I have two eye problems. And these two eye problems, they cancel each other out, uh, which is wonderful for me. So therefore, I still usually do not wear glasses. Uh, but there is a problem. Um, these things get worse if you are aging, and they, go uh, they go, uh, get worse 
in a different speed. <laughs> so therefore, <laughs> I'm for, since a few years, I noticed that, for example, if something is very small, I need some glasses to look at this. And so it's a little bit complicated for an optician to balance these kind of things. So um, what is the problem? If I see parallel lines, they are not parallel anymore with my special glasses. And for an engineer, this is horrible. We always look for this must be 90 degree to this, and this must be parallel to this. And suddenly, it's not parallel anymore. And of course, it's horrible to, to see this in an engineering drawing. And so these small kind of aberrations in optical systems, uh, they all need to be corrected by this huge number of glass lenses. Of course, I not want to have 30 lenses ahead of me. <laughs> this is not very practical. The image would be very nice, I guess, but <laughs> 30 lenses, uh, this requires two meters, and it's not very practical and nice. Um, so just having one lens, it's already impressive what these people can do. But um, the 30 lenses are available that you have, have the same optical quality over a huge, huge range. So therefore, it's so complicated and not just one lens. Okay, so um, here maybe let me see you a little bit what is happening if you have this kind of uh, problems. So we send a test image here. So here we play this character F. And then we project it to just one lens to make it simple. And then we have a look what is happening here. And what is happening here often that the image is blurred. It's not clear anymore. Here it's very clear. Here it's a little bit blurred. And this happens if the rays are not hitting one point. This means that the wave front here is a little bit bent. And so you can measure the wave front, and from this kind of wave front pictures, you can see what will be the quality of your thing. Um, or what also can happen is that this image is going up and down. This is a chief wave variation. Now, if you want to describe something like this, you use polynomials, Cernicke polynomials, like Fourier functions in signal analysis. Here we ha always have this kind of circular things, and so we use Cernicke polynomials. And here you can see a little bit what is happening. If you're just moving around one of the lenses, um, so here it's moving up and down, and it's getting blurred, it sometimes more, sometimes less, and also the wave front here is changing the behavior. So the first thing, if you start something like this, you have to be able to compute this kind of pictures using just following the rays and doing some analysis. Now, fortunately, optical systems usually behave as linear systems. Why? Because the motions are very, very, very small, and so very often you have linear systems, which makes our life much easier uh, to describe them. And then there are nice effects there. For example, um, when moving lenses. We had discussions with an optical company. Um, they tried for decades to make their lenses as rigid as possible. They not wanted to move them, and they made very complicated designs. And our idea was different. Uh, not try to make it as rigid as possible. Let the lenses move and use the vibration shapes in such a way that the errors are cancelling out. So here you can see, for example, if these two lenses are moving in phase, then this image is getting bigger and smaller, bigger and smaller. This is what you not want to have. What happens if these lenses vibrate out of phase? Fascinating, isn't it? The arrows are cancelling out, and this one here is nearly perfectly uh, done here. Wonderful. So this happens again and again when we are doing projects and if dynamics is involved. Not try to make things as rigid as possible. Try to understand the dynamics of the thing and use the dynamics for your advantage. Here, let these things move in such a way that the arrows are small. You not want to have them as rigid as possible. No, you want to have the arrows as small as possible. So really think about what is your goal. Uh, later I will show you a nice little experiment for this. Okay, so here, um, what do we need uh, for doing mechanical simulation? We need an elastic body description. We have to make model order reduction. We have to make a mechanical simulation. We have to make an optical simulation. And because it's complicated, we need control about this for ourselves. So most of the code here is written uh, by our team 
so that we really can change whatever we want to change. Uh, later, only at the very top to the left, you can see CMAX. CMAX is a very famous optical design program, a commercial one. Uh, this is a very powerful program. You can do nearly everything except dynamics. They are not so good in dynamics. Therefore, we do a lot of things ourselves and use the commercial program for verification only of certain aspects. I want to be here very short. Uh, now, um, in engineering, we know mode shapes. And the same, surprisingly, can also be done for optical systems. If you describe something as a linear system, the optical system, yeah, it also has mode shapes. And then you can also select only the most important mode shapes. This is, for example, how a first optical mode looks like, a second optical mode. If you superpose them, you get this kind of things. So again, if you want to make efficient simulations, think about model order reduction. How can you make systematically your models smaller? And then there are even worse effects here. When you uh, deform a lens, there is one obvious effect. If you deform a lens, it will not be circular here anymore. It will bend, and so the surface is changing. OK, this gives you some errors which you have to correct. But even worse, if you deform a lens, then the stresses in the lens are different at certain positions. If the stresses in the lens are different, then the optical properties are changing because the refraction index is depending on the stress level. If the refraction index is changing from point to point, then the light rays do not pass as a straight line anymore. So for example, here it goes here and then it's bending up and so no, no straight lines anymore. And so therefore you have to do differential ray tracing. So follow it step by step by step by step by step a much more complicated thing described by differential equations. I always try to tell our students, don't be afraid of differential equations and mathematics. Um, if you do not understand it, this is the place where you should work harder to understand. Uh, because this is the basis for everything we are doing. And the more complicated the problem, the more complicated the things you have to do. I want to be uh, short here how these stress modes are used for these optical modes, how to do everything, how to do model order reduction. Now, uh, the question is, um, is it really required to consider these stresses? Or is this something, um, a very small effect, which is not relevant practically? And here you can see uh, a plot where over time we compared the aberrations. Blue means the stresses are considered. Red means the stresses are not considered. And here you can see uh, this is very different what you have. There is a difference whether you consider the stresses or not. And you can see it also more clearly here. For example, if you have a structure like this one here, for example, one part of your chip, and you send it through the complicated lens system, this is the result what it should be. You cannot expect that it is as perfect as, as this one here. Mm, of course not. But this would, this would be good. Why? Because, for example, these four dots are clearly separated. Now, we have here, this one here. After two minutes, you get this kind of thing. And so this looks not too bad. Here, these ones are clearly separated left to right. Here, they are a little bit less separated, but still acceptable. This is the result when the stresses are not considered. Now you consider the stresses, and this is the result. Here, the structure is not separated nicely. If you build a chip and somewhere on the chip you have this kind of structure, you can throw away the chip. The whole chip is not usable anymore. Of course, the computation takes much longer if you do all these complicated stress things. This takes 68 minutes, this only two minutes. So you pay a price for it, but if you want to rely on it, keep this in mind, you need to consider the important effects. Again, I will make this jump over this. Um, all these motions of lenses and the changes of chief ray factors and so on. Um, here I want to show you a little bit what it is about. Another thing which is uh, not so complicated for us as engineers. When we do control systems, uh, we have different type of controls. One type is time domain control, for example, PID controllers and this kind of things. Uh, or you can do frequency uh, domain things. Um, if you do frequency domain, you make a Fourier transformation, 
Then you shape your dis uh, controller, you make an inverse Fourier transformation to reconstruct the signals and so on. And such a thing here, such an optical system, can be considered as a transformation element. Input signal is transformed to an output thing. And this can be also described in Fourier plane, in the frequency domain. So you get, for example, an image like this. And the beautiful thing is, if you do things in, fre in frequency domain, a multiplication is sufficient. While in time domain, you always need the time integration to get information. And so it's the same here. If you have an image, and if you fold it with this special uh, Fourier pictures, you can get the image, the optical image, just with the multiplication, which is basically free of any costs. Uh, what is included in this Fourier transformation are the wavefront aberrations again. So beautiful ideas. And so you can combine all this uh, and really get nice things. Now, um, let us uh, change a little bit the position of one lens in the system. And to see a little bit, if we move one lens, is this critical or is it not critical? And here uh, we use a sinus-shaped uh, disturbance signal with a certain amplitude. And if the amplitude is very small, 0 0.1 micrometer, then it looks good. So clearly separated. It's maybe moving around. OK, this is OK. But um, nearly nicely separated. Now, if you're increasing the amplitude to 0 0.3 micrometers, 0 0.7 micrometer, you can see already here, if you have 0 0.7 micrometer vibration amplitude, the optical system is destroyed. And again, you can throw away your chips. You cannot make the space observations or and so on. If you have three micrometers, nothing is left from the original signal. So therefore, it is for the companies really important to understand the vibrations. You can do the same thing with mirrors also. But I want to use my last slides for something else. <coughs> um, again, we want to do a kind of optimization. And again, we want to do measurements and simulations. So we want to see what is happening if our lens system is moving and can we adjust uh, the movement in such a way that we reduce the optical errors. Here, for example, this is just more or less moving up and down, and so the image is moving up and down. Here, everything is moving, but in a nicely synchronized way, using eigenforms, and this is hardly moving at all. And you can also see it here in the disturbances. Red belongs to this one here, where the eigenfrequencies fit together. Blue are the disturbances here. This one here cannot be used, this one here can be used. So it's worth to investigate this. We first did this in simulation alone. Uh, but the company was not really convinced that it's worth to uh, do this, and so we built a little experiment. And this little experiment, uh, we did everything, prepared everything in our lab, and made it just from acrylic material. Why? Because we have a laser cutting machine and it's very easy to produce these things. It's basically just like printing. Um, here are, down here are a number of lenses, I think eight lenses or so. Uh, here is a light source. Here is a camera which is recording the motion of this point here. And then uh, we can change all the stiffnesses, all the masses here, and let this vibrate. And the idea was, if we add some vibration, uh, can we reduce the disturbance? Okay, so this is the basic effect. We have a main body, the interior bodies, which can vibrate. There's an impulse hammer as an excitation, modal analysis, phrase grabber, high-speed camera, screen, and then we record everything. So this is what the experiment looks like if we do it in reality. You can see all these elements are moving a little bit. You cannot see it here in this beamer projection, but here is a light point here, uh, which is moving around because all these elements are shaking, and we can adjust all the stiffnesses and the masses here to influence the motion. But the question was, how should we influence the motion? And the idea was, let's take the frequency response and press down the maximum amplitudes by optimizing the parameters. And so <coughs> with an initial, initial set, we get the blue curve. With an optimized parameter set, the red curve, and the disturbance is greatly reduced. And if we uh, make a, a recording, then we get something like this. 
for the initial parameter set, the point is not always at the same position, therefore it's over a wider area. For the optimized parameter set, it's working nicely. So this was a purely passive thing. No active elements, no control, only adjusting the mechanical parameters. Now we wanted to continue and here we added a microactuator. This is a very precise actuator which we can control. We mounted the lens on top of it, only this lens here, and the question was, if we just move this lens around, can we reduce the error greatly? So a feedback, a controlled system. Except that this one actuator, everything was exactly the same. Now we need many things. Mechanics, we have a damped multibody system. Impulse, harmonic excitation. Optics, we need machine vision, image processing, electronics, informatics, embedded system, code generation, Arduino, Raspberry Pis, signal processing, control, all this is required. And here, um, uh, Aruna Disanayaka uh, came into the plane. Um, he contacted me uh, at the end of his bachelor studies. It was very nice, his application. I invited him to come to our institute. And then he did his master in Stuttgart. And during all this master time, he worked for us as a student assistant. Uh, and this was where he earned his money from for uh, living in Germany. And he set up this system. And the goal was we wanted to make these things not with very expensive, high-level hardware. We wanted to find out, is it possible to use cheap hardware like the Raspberry Pi or the Arduino, here another Arduino, um, here some quite cheap uh, cameras. Uh, here was also an expensive high-speed camera. Uh, but all this was low-price uh, hardware. And is it possible to bring together such a system? And <coughs> so he had to solve many things together with us. Um, so for example, we need the motion control of this vibration stage. Um, <coughs> we need uh, the trajectory following uh, for a pre-computed trajectory. All kinds of electronic things were involved here, which was really nice. He was very well educated here in your university because most of his knowledge he already had available. In simulation he was not as strong, but in the electronic part he was very impressively educated. Uh, we had to deal with uh, delays because the camera was not grabbing the frames in the right, um, in the right frequency. Um, and then uh, we were able to do all these experiments. There are all these little things, for example, there's a hall sensor for uh, measuring the distance precisely. Uh, this has a sign, it's a magnetic uh, sensor, and so he has a kind of wavy uh, structure like the one here. You have to calibrate it to get nice measurements. You can see complicated things to do, but if you do it, uh, you end up with something like this. On the top, you can see Oh, sorry. I go back again. On the top, there is um, uh, the not activated system. This is just the passive system. Here is the controller is active. You can see the stage is moving here. And if you compare the vibrations here, here you have big vibrations, which is not good. Here you only have very small vibrations, which is very nice, which gives you a good uh, thing. So with this kind of experiments, we could show uh, the people in industry that you can either do it in a passive way by adjusting the eigenforms, or you, you can do active control and also influence your system in such a way. Okay, final slide uh, for my visit in Moratuva. So, um, coupling dynamics, optics, mechanics, thermodynamics, all this is very important. Uh, when you have complicated systems, you always have to think about model order reduction, how to make your simulations faster without losing quality. Uh, and if you do this, then you can attack even this kind of complicated things. Um, especially for the younger ones, for the young lecturers, um, when you think about your own area of research, um, don't take the same thing as your supervisor of your doctoral thesis, for example, did before. Uh, select something which is different, which is strange. Um, dare to uh, select some side effects. Uh, all the most important effects, they are done already by big research groups somewhere. You cannot follow them easily. 
uh, select yourself smaller areas um, where you really can contribute something and then really not try to get just any solution but try hard to get the best solution available. Th this is where research comes into play and this fight for the best solutions uh, this is also what makes your papers being accepted by, by journals. If you just make a simple solution, you can be proud of it, yeah, true. You can see the first thing is working, but simple solutions will not be published. So in this sense, try a little bit to find niche products, niche areas, uh, and then concentrate on these, but do it in a high quality if you want to get your work published and want to do successful research. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thank you also very much for those who are with us on Zoom. And it was really my pleasure being here. And of course, I'm available for questions and uh, for discussion. Are there any questions or comments? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, how often, like, what is the kind of rate of like, having to throw away the, the work piece? Because how, like, how accurate they are? Um, <laughs> it's a long time ago. Our former Chancellor Kohl, it was this twice my size person, um, it's a really big person. Um, he was opening as an honorary guest a, a new chip uh, company in Böblingen, close to Stuttgart. And uh, so he was, although he had uh, this special suits on, he was guided uh, to walk through this production plant. Um, somebody told me that for about two months after he was guided through this plant, not a single chip w w left the company, all were destroyed because <laughs> his visit together with some people making photos and so um, made so much dust and disturbance to the machines uh, that everything was not calibrated anymore. So they ha really had to adjust everything very carefully, clean everything very carefully. So this single person with just a few persons following him was sufficient to completely shut down the production for a long time. And so these are really sensitive things. Um, for a Zeiss company, it's interesting um, when, when going there, sometimes they show visitors a, a part of these uh, things. Um, maybe when I go there, maybe one time out of five I'm allowed to go there. And it's interesting, they have uh, one floor uh, where you can walk through, and then it's a separate building connected with glass windows where is the production line. Uh, so it's really separated buildings. And still, if you walk along this thing, you have uh, for example, they take glue to your shoes that all the dust is when you have to wear special suits and so on. Um, Baird is completely uh, not appreciated by them. <laughs> uh, so, so it's really, really strange. So, so these are sensitive things. And um, when you buy such a machine, you have to expect that you need several months until everything is running smoothly. The uh, uh, only very simple ones. O only old ones, simple. Very expensive they are too expensive, yeah, yeah, yeah. And for us, um, for the university, uh, it would be too expensive to maintain and to have these machines and produce just a few simple chips. We do not produce masses of chips. They only can be paid for if you produce hundreds of thousands of chips and millions of chips. So, for example, uh, there is a nice company close to Stuttgart, uh, Robert Bosch, they are producing um, acceleration sensors for mobile phones. Um, so in all your mobile phones there are acceleration sensors for different uh, translations and rotations. Um, if you look at these things, there are ma many, many chips, just maybe two millimeter by two millimeter somewhere in the interior, and they produce millions of these chips, and still they never have enough of these, and they ask for high prices for these little things. So, so sometimes very small things can cost a lot of money, but you need to produce masses of them. No, our machines, we don't have a single one in our institute. We don't have the staff, we don't have the uh, competence to run them appropriately. In our electrical engineering department, they have one or two, but very simple ones, very old ones.
Yes, please. Uh, what, what, sorry, once again. Mm. Yes. Right. Um, the, the question was um, the, the properties of the lenses change due to internal stresses, and the reasons is the question. Um, two reasons. Uh, one, uh, the lenses can be bent. Um, so, for example, when you look at um, a typical uh, ca camera system, there are small screws, and with the screws you can clamp, you can hold the lenses at the right position. If you uh, attach the screws, you add mechanical stress, and this mechanical stress is changing the optical properties. So, um, therefore, for high-quality optical systems, lenses are not fixed by screws. They are glued to the right position, because then you can distribute the pressure over the, a larger area. Uh, the second source of stresses are thermal influences. If you uh, send a laser ray through a lens, uh, then in this area where the laser ray is hitting the lens, it's heating up a little bit. Um, usually this is not critical. For example, for your camera in, of the mobile phone, the energy is very small which is passing the lens. But if you want to use it for laser cutting, then you have to send a lot of power through the lens system. And then uh, the energy introduced is heating up the material locally and if heat material, material is heated locally there are again mechanical stresses created and the mechanical stresses create changes in the optical material properties and they create the errors in the images. So the stresses can have different sources. Thermal sources and mechanical sources are the main two. Gravity, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Th this has a big role. Um, these lenses are sometimes heavy, and so just moving a heavy thing creates stresses. Or if they are in a vertical position, uh, they are bending due to gravity. Again, you create stresses in mechanical stresses there. I have not shown it to them. I have some more slides about this, uh, where uh, the thermal effects are shown. So if you enter some energy at a certain point of a lens, then you create deformations, and then you can also see the chip, uh, the changes in the image. Mm -hmm. You're very welcome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. OK, so thank you very much for spending your time. Um, tomorrow I will also be here at the university, uh, the, my last day. Um, if you want to contact me, also feel free to send me an email, and then we can also discuss by email in the future. Okay, thank you very much.
Excuse me, sir. Yes, are you free on the evening? Uh, no, I, this afternoon I'm 